let's take a little bit deeper look at how density flows through the container. You'll see we've got a buoyancy of negative one in the container's attributes. You'll also see there's a density scale. And if I increase that, then I'll get basically thicker fog. Set that to one. Rewind and play back. And I can see it better in my viewport now too. So I'll give myself a few more frames here. I've only got 120 frames to my animation, but it's taking longer than that for it to reach the bottom of the container. So I'll give myself a little bit more time to work with. Let's say 480 frames. That should be plenty. Once we get it flowing the way that we like, we'll set an initial state and we'll be able to make it start on frame one without the run-up. Okay, so you can see that it's flowing downward and then it's starting to fill up the container. I'll just go back up to the top of the attributes because I just want to show you briefly that in the contents method section, some of the attributes such as density and velocity are set to dynamic grid and some are turned off. In this case, we do want to enable temperature and turn that to dynamic grid because we want hotter areas in our plasma to be a different color than cooler areas. We won't be using the fuel attribute in this exercise. So it's not necessary to use fuel to get a good looking combustion effect. Very good, so I'll scroll down and back in the density section, I'd like to talk a bit about dissipation and diffusion because currently, as you will see, the density is filling up the container. And of course, we don't want to see that. We just want to see a tail of fire coming out of the rocket. So we can use dissipation to accomplish that. Dissipation is density fading out over time. And diffusion is density spreading out over space. So I can use these attributes to get different effects. The problem is that I can't see what I'm doing if I just adjust this value. And if you rewind and play back to see what that did, then it's a very tedious and time-consuming process. But Maya provides an excellent solution to that, which is called interactive playback. If you've got lots of frames in your timeline, like I do, then you can use interactive playback to adjust sliders and see their effects immediately in the viewport. So I'll rewind. And then I'll go into the solvers menu in the dynamics menu set and turn on interactive playback. And it starts playing immediately. And I can adjust the dissipation in this case to show how as I increase dissipation, the fluid fades out. And as I decrease dissipation, we get more density. So interactive playback is great. So you can just dial in exactly the amount that you want for these different attributes. You might need even more time in your timeline than I have here. So if I was really gonna do this, I might even increase this as much as 2,400 frames, just to give myself plenty of time to play around with these attributes and get the look that I want. So again, dissipation is its fade out over time. You could think of it as kind of like the lifespan of the fluid, and then diffusion is the spread. I don't actually want any diffusion in this case. I want it to just be this pillar of fire. So I think my density is looking fine, and now I can start to look at how it's getting shaded and rendered. In my perspective view, I'll click the render button, and I can see now I've got a plume of density. So far, so good. I can give focus to my camera view and press 5 so I can see shading there too. And now that I understand what a voxel is, I'm actually going to go back into the attributes and just turn off that boundary display. In the display section, I'll turn boundary draw back down to, oh, well, let's set just a bounding box so we're not too distracted by that. To get a better look to our shading, I can go into the shading section. And this also points out the fact that the fluid shape node is both an object and its own built-in shader with attributes like 
transparency, color, incandescence, and so on. So for this particular exercise, I want self-illuminated fire that's going to look very thick and send out light into the scene. So I want the transparency to be very low, not completely zero, but pretty low. Let me maximize my perspective view. So I select that container. I don't want it to react to lights in the scene. I want it to be completely self-illuminated. So the diffuse color here should be black. So I'll click on this color swatch here and choose black. And incandescence now is going to drive the color. And you'll notice that there's already a ramp in here provided for us. And conveniently, it's already mapped to temperature. So there are different uh, properties that can map a color or incandescence channel. So for example, if I chose Y gradient here, this makes it kind of clear what's going on. With Y gradient chosen, at the top we'll have one color represented here. And at the bottom, we'll have another color represented here. We're not mapping to temperature, we're just mapping in space. And if I adjust these flags, we can see the effect. We can also change the input bias to simply uh, shift the effect in one direction or another. So now that we kind of see how that works, I'm going to switch this back to temperature and then adjust the input bias. And we can see we're going to get a more interesting and subtle effect. And then we'll click Render to compare that. Now, of course, what we see in the viewport and what we see in the rendering are never exactly the same, but we're on our way. And then also, the opacity could use some work. And what this is doing is it's mapping the density to the visibility of the fluid. So the more dense it is, the more visible it is on the screen. And that does actually interact with the overall transparency. So transparency is a multiplier factor for opacity. What I need in this opacity curve here is a sharp cutoff so that areas of low density will have no visibility and areas of high density will be visible or opaque. Click here to create another point on the graph and I can move these around. And you can see I can actually create a cutoff point. Here, let's build a kind of semicircular graph there, and then I can use input bias to shift it. So I can control the length. It's important that this first point on the curve must have a value of zero, as we see here. And if you're not sure, of course, you can make the curve larger. And in a child window, we can see what happens if that's not at a value of zero, then the opacity will completely fill the container. So that has to be zero. So we're roughing this out, getting a little bit closer and do another rendering. It doesn't look like much, but we are on our way. So I'm going to take that opportunity then to save. I'll save scene as. And I'm up to version 4.